this is Irene with Soccer Talks, and I am here today with Matthew Lamans, who is a managing partner. And Matthew is my dear guest today. He's managing partner and AI solution architect at the intelligence company, uh, intelligence factory instead. All right. So Matthew, welcome, welcome to Soga Talks. Thank you very much. It's awesome to be here. Absolutely. So I am now just uh, talking to my audience, however intimate it is for now, but I'm looking to grow it and the audience and friend of the audience, subscribers and those just who came about this video. So we need your likes. We need your shares. If you find topics, if you find any points of our dear guests putting out there, if you find it helpful or valuable, please react. You know how YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter treats any kind of posts, any kind of communication. So it's all about engagement. I know that guests are very engaging here, okay? I know that we're talking about great things. So please, if you're here already, okay, give us thumbs up or say something. And Matthew and I, we will engage, we'll answer any additional questions because it's, it's absolutely my pleasure today to talk to Matthew about a couple of big agenda items, okay? We will start with uh, Industry 4.0. We will talk about macro trends. We'll talk about fourth industrial revolution even. And as a natural progression uh, from that, we will talk about AI, AI adoption, and how Matthew worked with his cl clients, making sure that AI is not just high level agenda item. It is also a very practical and very systematic initiative. And Matthew will share his experience on program management, which I am sure a lot of practitioners out there will find very helpful. So Matthew, enough of me here, this stage of yours, let's talk about industry, let's talk about where we are, how we got here, and most importantly, what's ahead of us when pandemic is over? I love, I love it. Uh, this is a topic that I, I'm really excited about. And your intro to the video is perfect because we're living in the fourth industrial revolution. So you're, you're, you're asking the audience to engage and have a personal relationship with the content that you put out and the, the, the speakers that you have uh, on, the, on, this, on the series is perfect. It's right in line with where the world is going. So you're working from home, I'm working from home because of the pandemic, but that doesn't mean that the knowledge economy and the way that we do work and the, and the activities that we do are still progressing. But they couldn't have done this, what, five years ago, 10 years ago? Uh, and certainly 20 or 30 years ago, we wouldn't imagine having interactions and, and video calls. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating world. And um, it's one that uh, companies, people are adopting this technology and the activities and the behaviors and the expectations much quicker than companies are. But the companies are now really exploring what does it mean to operate in a digital world? And they knew it was coming, but really in the last couple of months, uh, they really felt that they have to adjust their operations to meet the demands of, of what the world has, has put on us. And not only does that, what's that mean for operations, but looking further, if they can just keep business going the way it is now with a different distributed workforce, people working from home, uh, still getting the production that they want, what does it mean for the other things that they would like to do or the ways for them to engage with their consumers, produce the, the products and services that they want, that their core activities produce. And how do they do that in a new way so that they're more competitive, they make more money, they're more agile um, to the, and responsive to their customers. So um, I love it, it's, it's a very exciting time. We didn't know 2020 was gonna be like this, but it's, uh, it's certainly uh, something, one for the books. Good to have you here, Matthew. So let's start with what we might know already, okay? Industrial revolution number one, two, three, and why four is so different. Can you kind of sum up for us? I sure can. Uh, the, we now looking, now looking back, we see that uh, the ways that we've organized work uh, and uh, our relationship to work, what it means for uh, economies on the local scale as well as on the global scale, it's evolved over time. And 
uh, but it took a long time to get rolling. And now once it's rolling, uh, we can see the changes and what that means. And so really, when we look back at how people interacted, how much money they made, how long they lived, the standing of living, and some core metrics, not much had changed in certainly in recorded history, which is about uh, uh, well-recorded history, which is about uh, 1000 AD to uh, 1750. Uh, if you looked at uh, living in that, in that period of time, um, the more that people produced, they, there was a, uh, an interesting phenomenon that you could have advances in production and people were using machines, uh, everything from uh, windmills to water mills for grinding, um, uh, spinning looms for a thread. But the increases in production only, uh, if the, the effect of increases in production were an increase in population. It wasn't an increase in per capita wealth. And so uh, there was a drive to increase production, but it wasn't as, as strong as what's happened uh, fundamentally in the late 1700s. So there's this period prior to the first industrial revolution where uh, if you wanted to make things, most things were made um, by hand. And so it was an artisanal and a craftsman model of production. So you had shops and you had uh, people who lived above their shops and they were, uh, you could get really well-made item, items. They were custom made in many cases, uh, but they didn't interact very well with other, they weren't interchangeable. So they weren't exchangeable with other parts. Um, and if you didn't get the item made by a craftsman, uh, you got a poorly made item. And uh, what had changed was in the first industrial revolution, we started having mechanized production. And mechanized production is the, is the hallmark of the period of time between about 1765 and 1865. It's, it's interesting that these industrial revolutions are almost 100 year periods. And so between 18, 1765 and 1865, we had mechanized production. Uh, it was basically a steam power uh, industrial revolution. And machines started making other items. And so we took production out of the hands of custom made uh, by people. And we started having machines making things. And now we can make, it took a lot of people, but we can make a lot of things faster. And this, this mechanized production broke the, what's called the Malthusian trap. And that Malthusian trap is the trap of increased production only increases people, the number of people on the planet. It doesn't increase wealth. And the time between 1765 and 1865, we saw uh, uh, per capita income grow. We saw lifespan grow. So if you were born any time before 1765, you normally have average lifespan in Europe was about uh, 28 uh, years of age. And by 1865, that expanded to about 38 years of age. And there's a big disparity between the industrialized countries and the pre-industrialized countries in terms of lifespan. Um, the second industrial revolution built on the first one. They really didn't, uh, if you think of industrial revolutions, you should think of them as evolutions because we, we don't throw away what worked in the past. We just expand on it and get better at it. So the second industrial revolution is an energy revolution in many regards. And so electricity replaced steam power. And so you can make many more things of, of that are exactly alike um, with much less people now and you can make them faster. And so we had also scientific management, uh, professional management of companies, um, interoperability of parts. And so now the, the parts from one factory uh, could be exchanged uh, in uh, a system uh, from parts that were made from a different factory because of standardization. And that second industrial revolution had a phenomenal impact on lifespan. Lifespan went from about 38 years, average of 38 years to 78 years. Uh, uh, 72 years of age uh, between 1865 and 1965. Per capita income and wealth uh, uh, exploded. Uh, the number of people, literacy rates uh, uh, went up across around the globe. Um, uh, 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 infant mortality went down. All the major indicators improved with each industrial revolution. In the third industrial revolution, so what happens in the third industrial revolution, it builds on mechanized process, processes in the first industrial revolution. So we got machines making things. It's electric powered. And so we have mass production. So we have uh, machines and systems making uh, the exact same thing. But in the third industrial revolution, really what we see is automation. And so we have uh, computers and, and control systems operating 
the, the methods of production. And so what we're seeing is we want to have the same goal in the third industrial revolution as we had in the past. We want to make uh, highly standardized identical items, goods and services, mostly goods. Uh, and we, found that we find that uh, computer control of that production system uh, uh, increased uh, 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 margins. We made more money. Lifespan uh, improved uh, the, uh, um, the education uh, around the globe. Uh, more people uh, in terms of literacy rates uh, went up and things got much, much better. What's, and we're, we're about half, we're about 50 years into that uh, industrial revolution. And there's a little compression in terms of how long the industrial revolutions go. But now we're getting smarter. And we've got this, uh, this optimization curve where we're always trying to get better and better. And we're saying, well, what's the next thing beyond auto simple automation? And we know we've talked about the fourth industrial revolution. We talked about digital transformation. And what does that mean in, at the macro sense, at the megatrend level that you, that you mentioned, we, you opened up the, the session with? In the fourth industrial revolution, the fundamental mindset change isn't, is that where in the past we want to make like items, everything's the same, uh, and we want to make a, make a bunch of them, and we want to use less people, we want to make more money doing it, and we want to do it faster, cheaper, uh, and with a higher degree of, of uh, uh, precision. We want all of that. We don't want to give that up. But in the fourth industrial revolution, the mindset change is what we want is those items to be mass produced. We want it to be cheap. We want it to be fast. But what we also want is we want to get what we had way back before the first industrial revolution, which is highly customized, perfect fit items. So we want mass production and we want customization together. And that's a fundamental change between what we've had in the, in the previous industrial revolutions. And it's a fundamental change that's driven the growth of companies um, uh, like Amazon and Netflix and YouTube. And you see, how do you get uh, all these goods and services that are mass produced? They're distributed uh, highly quickly, but what the, the consumer gets is highly customized or unique to their experience and their, and their needs and their demands. Personalized, right? Customized. Personalized. Next level, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is exactly right. And so that's the challenge that companies have across the board, regardless of, of uh, what industry they're in. So if we talk about healthcare, how do you personalize healthcare? Well, it's personalized medicine. And so the fundamental change that we'll see in, uh, from this point forward is not sick care, not care in the healthcare system oriented towards uh, getting people back into a state of well-being when they're sick. So I've got a disease, I go to the doctor, I go to the hospital to get that disease or, or cancer cut out. Um, it's, healthcare is going to evolve from that to well, wellness care. So it's going to be personalized medicine to keep you well and healthy versus to get you back into being well and healthy. And the, the promise of the fourth industrial revolution is that we've seen lifespans increase with, with the last three industrial revolutions. And now around the globe, whether you're in Europe and the, and the difference between industrial, industrialized nations in lifespan and, and non-industrialized nations. So if you look at uh, uh, lifespan on the African continent, uh, across the globe, uh, they're, they're getting closer and closer together. So it's a rising tide that's lifting all boats. And in many regards, uh, I know that it's very stressful now, but in many regards, there's never been a better time to be alive on earth than right now. So you can live longer now, more people are literate right now, infant mortality is down, um, uh, across your uh, uh, per capita GDP, gross domestic product is, is up across the board. Uh, so more people have more spending money uh, and they also have more leisure time than they've ever had. And so all of these things are, are producing uh, very good results. And when we start seeing fundamental changes in industry, so for example, in healthcare, going from sickness care to wellness care and keeping people healthy, we're going to see an, an, another advance in lifespan. And it's not just lifespan where people think that um, uh, uh, without personalized medicine that uh, the average can get close to 120 years of age in terms of uh, 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 lifespan. Um, what, what they really think is that um, 
uh, with personalized medicine that you could actually have a longer of your life uh, being productive and being happy and being uh, 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 well suited for the world. Uh, so you got a much more happy part of your lifespan instead of a long period of time at the end of your life where you're not very healthy and you're not very happy. So that, that period of time is compressed and you're living much longer. So that means you that we'll have- me, Matthew, will you convince me just here now, okay? How lucky you <laughs> are, okay? Being born when and how we were born, okay? I was born in Soviet Union. So our yeah. next, next lecture will be about how country tried to jump to that third industrial revolution rather quickly in 1917. And I have my strong yeah. opinions on what did not exactly work in that experiment. So the moment mm -hmm. when you mentioned that it was rather evolutions, not revolutions, okay, also important. So fantastic topics. So we are, first of all, we're very lucky. Second of all, the access, right? The access to resources, to education, to healthcare, absolutely grew in past 50 years. Okay, look at us now. Okay, my grandmother at my age was really rather an aging lady, okay? And I refused to oh, yeah. the reality. So all I'm saying, yeah, yeah, all the positive things. And, and what you mentioned is uh, medicine, right? Getting us rather not back to well state. That's a wonderful, wonderful change because going back to well state, meaning that we're back to the conveyor line to kind of work in the industrialized wor world, right? But now we're all about what? We want, we want to self-express. We want to realize our potential, right? That means we have to care of ourselves day to day. So absolutely. So do you want to jump in tech world, okay? How technology keeping us healthy and happier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, love to. Yeah, because when we see, it's interesting to start uh, in a period of time to think of the, the big picture but we can't live in the big picture because we live in the real world and with real tact at the tactical level. And so even though, you know, the people living in extreme poverty is really low, basic education is high, literacy rates are high, vaccinations are high, the number of people in the, around the globe that are living in a democracy versus a uh, totalitarianism is, is uh, democracy is high and, and the, um, the totalitarianism is, is low. Um, we got to say, well, what do we, what do, that doesn't happen by chance, first off. And secondly, uh, it's interesting, but we can't live there, right? We can't put food on the table thinking about these big grand things. We got to think about what can we affect and what can we do uh, with the people that are around us. And so we're getting asked by companies in the manufacturing space and, and uh, other organizations to help them in this transition. Their, their operations now, the way that they're doing business now isn't broken, but their concern is that they're gonna be replaced or, or evolved out of business or their, their market share isn't gonna be sustainable knowing that things are changing again. And it's changed recently enough that they can remember a time when the way that they're doing business now wasn't the way that they thought they were going to do business when they started their, their, their companies. And so whether it's, you know, communications technology, internet technology, computer technology, um, the supply chain, uh, they're getting parts from many different suppliers, sometimes around the globe. Um, and so the complexity of their operations now is much more, is at a higher level than what they ever thought it was. And so they've seen change up to this point. They know change is coming again. And they're saying, okay, what do we do about it? And how can we take some control in this process versus letting it happen? And somebody's going to win. They want to be the winners. And that, at that tactical level is really what's interesting to me now. And so uh, I think a lot about, we talk a lot about uh, at the C-suite level about leadership and transformational leadership. What's it mean to be a leader of distributed teams? And, and how, do you, how do you organize efforts around innovation um, where the, you have to have a rational exploration of options? You, it's not you know, academic research at a university, which is needed at the fundamental level, but what we're really looking for are, what are some likely objectives that we could achieve? And what are the requirements to meet those objectives? And then how do we actually do the work to meet the requirements? And so uh, leading teams that are oftentimes cross-functional, many times those teams are um, not only cross-functional, but some of them are uh, made up of members in your organization, some are with partner organizations, or they're from uh, uh, 
consultants or, or project teams and that kind of stuff uh, becomes really challenging. And um, you have to be very focused because uh, one of the things that, that we're at a stage of now in artificial intelligence and basically uh, intelligence uh, uh, oriented programming. Uh, so some of it's AI, some of it's deep learning, some of it's uh, uh, pro probabilistic programming, some of it's just pure algorithms, um, is how do we use all the tools in our to tool set most efficiently? And what's the optimal learning that we can uh, apply to this, this problem to get to where we need? So what's the, because nothing is free. You know, we could store data much less expensively than we have ever had, but the collection of data isn't free. And so we have to say, well, how much time do I have? How much money do I have to collect this data? What's and the likelihood of finding data that I want to collect, right? What is the data? Because I cannot be collecting all what the is data. The it data. becomes expensive, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And making representations of that data. So not only can you need, do you need to collect the data, but very early on, especially in uh, IoT and distributed networks, even with 5G, pushing that data up through 5G into data centers, uh, the data centers are, are still having a choke point, right? They, they can only ingest data so quickly. And our ability to push data is, is expanding so rapidly that the data centers are having a hard time ingesting that data. And so what happens is you could still send it, but if you want real time uh, and short latency uh, decisions, uh, you have to make a representation of that data and only send a representation up to uh, a, uh, the data center uh, in real time. And then in, later in off peak times, you can send the, the, the raw data. Um, and you also see the, the pressure to, and this is really interesting, and this is one of the things that we really are focusing on at the intelligence factory. You see the pressure of pushing inference to the edge. So you wanna make smart devices uh, have some autonomy and be able to have real time uh, interactions with the data that they're coming in, that they are sensing. And uh, uh, that's really exciting because one of the things that, that I really want to do, I'd love to live in the Star Trek world and my little, hopefully my, my purpose is to get us a little bit closer to that, is to be able to put re AI into the real world and real applications for real people. And that means you have to make it small. You can't, it's very, it, most of us don't have, you know, millions of images and data sets, right? We don't have the data that, Amazon trains on and Netflix trains on and YouTube trains on. Um, we've got realistic real world size data sets. And uh, what we're doing is, at the intelligence factory is making AI that can be reliable and explainable and, and has a high utility on realistic size data sets. Uh, and that's really cool because I think that opens up the possibility for smart machines, smart devices to be in the real world. Um, and learn at hopefully at getting closer to a pace at which people learn, um, which is which is really what I want, really where I want to go. Beautiful. You know, you mentioned explainable AI. So let me grill you on this term a little more because we all talk about what the data-driven decisions. We talk about right taking company data, taking dark data and make use of it, right? And using the tools, including AI, AI is not the only tool, right? But we right. use many tools there. Tell me about transparency. Tell me about, you know, traceability of the decision made based on the AI analysis and data. Okay, because that bothers us at many levels. Mm -hmm. That's a great question because uh, it starts, you know, by what do we mean by explainability? Uh, do we mean regular uh, or regularity? Uh, so if it always happens, is that a level of explainability that's sufficient for whatever application that we're working with? Or does explainability mean you can decompose the, the, the output into its component parts? Uh, and so you really need to be able to pull it apart and say that that decomposition is a, is a fundamental aspect of how I need to be explain the answer that I got. Another aspect of explainability is um, not only regularity or de decomposition, but it, it's also uh, this aspect of confidence. And I think those three uh, fact features of explainability kind of capture the majority of where people are talking about it. 
So in terms of, 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 um, of confidence, uh, many models can't tell you when they're confident about an answer, like a, a recommendation system uh, or in a prediction, um, because their architecture just doesn't support that. Um, and, uh, uh, but there are new technologies, uh, particularly in Bayesian uh, uh, probabilistic programming that give you confidence bounds. And so they have the ability to have more of an engineering uh, style of approach in terms of um, specificity, in terms of their tolerances for the outputs. And you can say, well, look, the, the model is confident in this answer, uh, or it'll give you an answer, but it's really not confident because of the confidence bounds. So really it's regularity. Do things happen all the time? Uh, can, we, can we break down the answer into its components and get a little bit better of an understanding? Um, or how can we get an a, a indication of how confident the system is in its output? Um, but it, it really gets, comes to the way we, you and I think, right? So if you and I say, well, look, we go to the doctor and we say, doc, I'm not feeling good. And the doctor says, uh, oh, I think you've got, um, I need to do a test, but I think you've got diabetes or something. And we say, well, that's an answer. That's a prediction, right? Uh, we can do more testing. Um, but how did the doctor come to that answer? Right? Or what's the explainability from the doctor, right? The doctor's head is a black box, just like AI is a black box. And we can say, well, look, um, maybe she has training. And so it's all this history that, that comes into it. And she says, you know, she can, she can explain why she, she's, she's giving you the answer, but the answer is going to be the same, right? Um, and so it, we get to those, those features and say, look, for different applications, we need different levels of explainability and or or visibility and traceability of the answer um sometimes you don't need a uh an elaborate uh explanation because the risk is low right it's it's not a mission critical or safety critical application and so you don't need to overbuild your your solution to have a level of detail that it's a perishable item right it's not needed um but in other cases where uh control systems where you need high level of regularity you need high level of, of explainability and that decomposition so you can see this, the parts in the system and why they're producing outputs in, the, in a chain of, of events. Um, then you do need to be able to have an architecture in your system that allows for that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and ultimately, a big part of the explainability, from the consumer's point of view, a big part of the explainability is, comes from the data. So if you have a computer system and the system can be trained in one of two ways in general, super large uh, categories. One is people can put in the instructions and the computer can go through alg algorithms and spit out an answer. So you know the instructions. And so that's a level of explainability. The second level of, of ways that the computers can learn is you can give them a bunch of data and some general rules and they'll learn from that data and they'll spit out answers. The problem with that second alternative is that the data isn't human, humanly readable. It's too much. We can't get our mind around it. Uh, and so that's where uh, people are concerned about bias. So if you put in just a bunch of text data from a, bunch, a whole corpus of, of books and you start asking questions, um, then you, we, you and I couldn't read all the books. We couldn't read the source material or ingest the raw data in, for example, um, and so we, we don't have a familiarity with the inputs that are producing the outputs. And that sometimes uh, causes people concern, you know, so it's, it's, and so you say, well, look, does it increase explainability if you have a second layer of a, um, of descriptive statistics around the data? So you not only have the recommendation that was produced on the data, but you can have uh, some statistics in terms of the gender pronouns or or whatever have you right um, and it gives you so it gives you an indication as to why the the answers were produced that they were um, uh, and, and that might help in some cases too but really it's it's right sizing the expectations yeah yeah it's kind of give us or i guess managers in charge and executive and leaders in charge right it gives some peace of mind that you know the output that i got and i base my next decision right based on these predictions and recommendations right that i'm more comfortable taking it as a, as a factor as a decisive factor right 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 but this is this right. is absolutely yeah this is fascinating 
And of course, answers, answers as I'm talking to my guests, you know, month to month, week to week, answers to similar questions change. Okay, that's how fast, mm -hmm. you know, reality is changing around us. So absolutely. Matthew, how about um, three takeaways? You can make it two, you can make it five. You know, the number is yours, okay? In terms of digital transformation and digitizing your business, okay, in this fourth industrial revolution wave, okay? Where do you find the most success? What are the success factors actually, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the number one takeaway uh, that uh, I, you, the takeaway is people should think of the industrial revolutions as um, compass headings. So for a hundred period, for a period of about a hundred years in the first industrial revolution, everyone thought true north was mechanization. And that's how you made, made money. You just mechanized a process. So if you made it by hand, make a machine to make that thing you made by hand. In the second industrial revolution, the true north now was mass production. If you had one machine that can make it, may have five machines that make it faster and make it even more level precision and use less people. That's how you made money and things went along really well. In the third industrial revolution, the new orientation, the new north was get a computer to control the machine to automate the process. Take people farther away from, from the process so that you can have more standardization and you could, you could really produce uh, uh, the exact same item, faster, cheaper, and that's how you made money. Mm -hmm. There's a new north to the way our company should orient their business. And that new north is make things customized. And that or as, as much as possible within, this, within the, the universe that, that your company lives. So you have to make things personalized, customized, different, and more, more fitting to the need that the, that the customer wants. And you got to do that inexpensively because people aren't going to spend more money than they need to. You got to do it fast. You can't do it slow. An answer two weeks from now isn't as good as an answer this week or today. And it's got to be able to, as best as possible, not only be customized to their need, but interact with the other things that they may want to do in the future or that they already have in place, whether that's in the manufacturing set on, setting, a consumer setting, healthcare setting, whatever it is. So your piece of the puzzle can't break up the other pieces. It has to play nice, right? That's the number one takeaway. The second part of that is, if that's gonna be your goal, how do you get your teams to coordinate and think about the way that they should orient their new, new way of doing business to explore these opportunities, pick a course, and then work towards the fulfillment of that course. And that's really the leadership that you have to take in terms of uh, working in times of uncertainty. You know, COVID-19 is, is uh, thrown uh, a, a high level of, of uncertainty on top of a world that was already moving fast. And so in some ways, things have slowed down. We're at home, we're maybe not be traveling as much, we're not going out to eat as much, and things seem like they're slowing down a little bit, but the media hasn't changed, right? How fast in, in, information comes to us, and we have information overload. And so we can't ingest all the information that we wanna ingest. We have to get really good at something and we have to work with other people who are really good at their other thing in teams to a common effort. And getting, ourself, getting us ourselves in a place where we can work collaboratively, collaboratively with one another towards a common goal in a fixed period of time with a fixed budget towards a, a goal that actually has a path to impact and a time to market that is meaningful for an organization. That's, that's the, the magic, right? So we know that things are changing. We, we know that we, we have to believe we have power to, 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 to interact with the world and that if we do it right, things are continuing to, to get better and better because they've already gotten better in the past. And I think that's one of the big take home messages. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. So thank you. You're awesome. Yeah, well, I love, exactly. And I want to hear. Yeah, yeah. I'm I want to hear. I want to hear more of your story, too, because your story is uh, I talk with so many people who come from varied backgrounds. And it's, I live in, in Southern Illinois. So it's, it's rolling countryside hills and, and there's, there's uh, horse farms and, and wheat fields, corn fields. And I couldn't imagine when I was growing up speaking to someone 
who was from Russia or being having partners uh, on my team from India or London uh, or in the West Coast of the United States. It just wasn't in my world. But I'm so happy to be in that world today because it's so exciting that the diversity of thought, the diversity of backgrounds and where people want to go and the commonality of, of people being nice and wanting to work together, it's awesome. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. And I think this is a, an awesome show that you have and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of it. You know what, Matthew, you are in it now because one talk we're going to do, and it's going to be about society and cultures and technology will weave in for awesome. sure, right? But you are on it, okay? So I'm signing up because believe me, growing up, I did not have many American friends for some reason, okay? I did not. <laughs> yeah. And yet, absolutely. So let's infuse some positivity in this world today because there are lots of different problems and talks and issues everywhere, okay? Let's make it positive, something about good, good things that surround us, okay? You are sounds just good to signed me. up for this and I will keep you accountable and transparent. That and sounds great. You got my number, so you know how to get hold of me. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So thanks. Talk to you. Talk to you, Matthew. Absolutely. This was fun. Sounds great.